from the general point of view, I would say that uh, the quality of the response is very important in the treatment of patients with myeloma. And it's well established that uh, the best the quality of the response, the longest the progression free survival, and also probably the longest the overall survival. The question about early versus late relapse, I think that is important, but from my personal point of view, what is much more important is the quality of the response and know if the patient achieved this quality of the response very early or late over the course of the disease. In my clinical activity, I prefer one patient achieving probably partial response after induction, very good partial response after transplant, and complete response after consolidation, so the response is improving over the course of the disease, and I prefer this type of kinetic of the response than one patient achieving complete response with minimal residual disease positive after induction, that after transplant the minimal residual disease remain positive, and after consolidation and after transplant the minimal residual disease stay positive. So I think that the important concept is the quality of the response, and know if the response is achieved earlier or later over the course of the disease. The best the response, the longest the progression free survival. And, uh, but it's not completely true that uh, when one patient achieves an optimal response uh, very early, the outcome is going to be better because uh, there are some patients in which uh, the good response is achieved very early, but also they immediately relapse. So what is uh, important is the chemosensitivity. So how the response is improving when a patient received subsequent steps of therapy, induction, transplant, consolidation, and maintenance. And this is really important and relevant. Uh, so early response uh, um, has two phases. But usually the majority of patients who have an early response have good prognosis, but there's a subset which relapses quite fast. And that has been shown already in the 70s. So um, usually early response is fine, but uh, when you look at different data sets, you see that those patients who achieve in response that there's a subset of patients who receives a response only after uh, long-standing therapy, and th those patients do very well. So it's not, um, let's say, uh, it does. So the concept doesn't fit to everybody. So yeah, it's good to have an early response uh, and, uh, as fast as possible, but uh, we also have to acknowledge that there's that there's a significant proportion of patients who which does very well uh, who, uh, achieve response only after a while. I think long-term treatment is now uh, very hot in, in myeloma debates uh, because it's not very well defined. Long-term uh, usually needs when you look at young transplant eligible patients, uh, maintenance therapy until progression or uh, intolerance. It is not clear whether a shorter period of maintenance in those patients is as good as continuous treatment. We have some indications from one study, from the first study, that long-term benefits particularly patients who have a very good response, which against our previous thinking that you can discontinue treatment there. But the data show if you have a very good response, CR, PR, or very good partial response, you benefit particularly from continuous treatment. So again, it is um, you have to look uh, at the specifics of your patient and the response characteristics, and then have to decide. But agreeable, we don't have very good studies which uh, um, compare, for instance, one year maintenance, two year maintenance uh, with continuous treatment. But what we know from old studies is with thalidomide that the short-term maintenance um, significantly impacted on PFS and also on OS. So my favorite is, of course, uh, a maintenance therapy which uh, has some end. But uh, it, uh, it may be more complex than that because patients like this. 
and our patients want to, they ask you, when can I stop therapy? And it is always um, a relief for them, but also for the physician, if you see an end of therapy. So we need more data on that, and we probably need more um, data on, uh, on the individual's patient's risk and benefit uh, uh, from long-term therapy. So we need predictive factors, who benefits from long-term, who benefits from one year, who benefits from two years, and who doesn't benefit at all from maintenance, uh, because there is a subset which doesn't benefit. In the myeloma field, I think the paradigm is shifting towards longer term treatment. Now, we don't really know whether that means two years, three years, four years, or till disease progression. We certainly know in some groups of patients, um, in the post-transplant setting, the maintenance treatment clearly improves outcome. We know in the high-risk patients, continued therapy till disease relapse is probably the ideal way to go. So increasingly, there is a trend towards using long-term therapy in patients with myeloma. As we study this group further, maybe we will identify a subgroup of patients in whom long-term therapy is not required. But until that uh, is better delineated, I think the default is going to be longer-term therapy as long as the patients can tolerate the treatment without any long-term toxicity and any irreversible toxicity. So I think the key thing for long-term therapy is having drugs which can be given without cumulative toxicity, which are convenient to take, so increasingly, there's going to be dependence on uh, oral medications, especially combinations of oral medications or monoclonal antibodies, which can be given less often. And, and increasingly, there are studies looking at uh, delivering some of those uh, drugs in subcutaneous fashion, which can actually also increase the ease and make the logistics easier. When we prescribe a long-term treatment for a multiple myeloma patient and we explain to him or her that the treatment has to be continued until progression disease or until toxicity is unacceptable, I think that we have some challenges. One of them is the toxicity profile, because if we plan a continuous therapy, the tolerability has to be excellent the side effect has to be minimal. We have to try to preserve the quality of life of the patients, and if possible, we have to try to maintain patients in their daily living activities. This is a big challenge that we have to try to reach. And in addition, another important challenge when we plan a long-term treatment is the adherence to the treatment. And I think that the adherence is clearly related with the toxicity profile. And of course, together with the other adherence as well as the toxicity, the efficacy is important. But if we see efficacy, I think that it's easy to convince to the patients to continue on therapy but uh, we have uh, to ensure that the quality of life and the toxicity profile have to be excellent. If we have uh, to plan uh, a long-term treatment for one patient, the route of administration is, of course, a key point. And uh, the oral administration is much more convenient, so it's much more important for the patients to try to maintain uh, their quality of life and their daily living activities, because uh, the oral administration make it possible to reduce the number of visits to the hospital, the IV administration, and definitely is a plus for the long-term treatment.